Good morning, brothers and sisters. We are a couple of minutes late. Do apologize uh, for that. No excuses. So we won't make any. This is an encouraging word. It's sending out that notification to let you know that we are here. Of course, you, I'm sure, know who I am unless you've just recently joined. And so we're certainly glad to have you with us on this morning. Again, it's sending out that notification. We typically like to already have been here a couple of minutes early, and therefore we'd already be uh, getting it in. We won't we won't linger in terms of the broadcast time frame. Uh, we do set this time first and third Sunday, where we have the opportunity to come. We 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 set this as a time to encourage you, to edify you. We don't just want to come and say things that, that seem or sound uplifting. We want to come and say things that are biblically accurate and that are going to uh, bring edification uh, to your soul. And, and truth, ironically, is what we all need as believers in Jesus Christ. And not just because of a time like this, though this is certainly a time we don't want to start avoiding truth and just start saying coming up with mantras to try to encourage ourselves we want to get down to the heart of the matter of scripture now we nuance them and I say this for all those who are preachers on the channel we certainly have no problem with nuancing our messages with current events and an understanding and awareness of what's going on and wherever we can we certainly want to speak to that with biblical accuracy as our foundation. That being said, I think we've, we've given enough time uh, for it to send out the notification. I want to say personally, as the founder, uh, uh, creator and founder of this particular, technically it is a group on Facebook, uh, uh, I appreciate those who are not just simply on the channel as we call it, but our active participants, and we, we, we certainly appreciate you uh, uh, watching it back. And, 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 of course, there's no way for us to know how long you're viewing, how much of the programs you view. But if you even watch five seconds of any broadcast, we thank you. And we pray those few seconds you've heard were enough to, to at least communicate some notion, some idea, some point from Scripture that we pray you need it. Uh, please encourage people to come. I, since I'm in this place, please encourage others to join by sending out an invitation. Yes, you can do that. This is a closed group, so people can't just come on here. And trust me, they would. If I if I opened up the group, yeah, I'd get more participation. But you can't imagine some of the things people want to post because of when you see an audience size of 447, 48 people. You can't imagine what kind of things people want to post. And by closing the group, I have to approve those posts. And I'm getting stuff from people that's not even Christianity, not even Bible, let alone about Christ. And I guess they didn't read the thing that says victory in Christ. <laughs> victory. I have people who want to try to sell T-shirts. And, and, and asking for prayer is great. But we do a prayer broadcast on Mondays. And so they can come and do prayer requests at that time. So we, we offer prayer. We offer more than just preaching and teaching. We offer prayer uh, uh, as well. So uh, uh, and that, let me just plug that broadcast because we'll be right back here tomorrow morning at 6 Central Standard Time, 6 a.m. Central Standard Time to pray. And so we hope that you will join us, send me messages uh, uh, on my personal page. I have two personal pages, Gabe Matthews. And then uh, one we use more or less for just posting and, and sharing these videos, Victor E. Ministries. I'm sure you can get the cleverness of that, Victor E. Ministries. All right, to what we're here for. Again, I'm your host, Gabe, Pastor Gabe, and this is an encouraging word we do on first and third Sundays of each month. Let's go to the scriptures. The Gospel according to John chapter 8, starting at verse 30. And I read from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Here's what it said. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, crowd of people, I want to make sure you get this, and some were coming to believe in what he was saying. 
didn't mean they were becoming Christians. We want to be careful with, when we see word belief, we just assume Christian. No, they were believing what he was saying. They were believing his particular words at that time. So he said, so Jesus said to the Jews, to the Jews who had believed him, what he was saying at the time, if you continue in my word, uh -huh, you really are my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It would suggest that they were not already free. We are descendants of Abraham, they answered him. And we have never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say, we will become free? Jesus responded, I assure you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in the household forever, but a son does remain forever. Therefore, if the son sets you free, you really will be free. I know you are descendants of Abraham. But if you are trying to kill me because my word is not welcome among you, but you are, excuse me, trying to kill me because my word is not welcome among you, I speak what I have seen in the presence of the Father. Therefore, you do what you have heard from your Father. I did add a couple of verses there. Uh, sorry, that wasn't in the note. The, Notation, I'll go back and change that before we post it. My title, very simply, for these last few minutes, this is only a 30 minute broadcast, and so let me move along, is I know the truth. I know the truth. And obviously, our key verse here is taken from verse 32 uh, You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Some translations say, I believe King James says, will make you free. Before we get into that, as you know with me, let's do a little bit of background work so we can have a clear understanding by the conclusion of this message where we need to be thinking and what Jesus was conveying. Most of us look at words as equivocal or ambiguous or unspecific. That's all equivocal means. Which allows us to apply any meaning, really, almost that we want to apply. Uh, uh, slang is a, a, a premier example of this. This is, is, is probably at the top of that list of examples that we could give for equivocating words and their meanings, for making words ambiguous in their defining. Uh, 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 for example, here's a phrase that I grew up with and I'm familiar with, and some of you might be, man, that's dope. That is dope. Now, if you were around the hip-hop culture, eh, say the 80s, may, I, I don't know if that, that phrase carried over uh, into the 90s, but man, that's dope, definitely in the 80s as hip-hop rose uh, 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 into uh, uh, popularity in that time. So if you hear that, you understand that to mean, man, that's good. Man, that's awesome. Man, that's wonderful. Man, that's Here's another one, man, that's fresh. You would have understood, man, that's dope to mean that's, that's good. That's a good thing. Man, that's, 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 a, that's an awesome thing. However, if you did not grow up in the 80s hip-hop culture, in and around the 80s hip-hop culture, if you uh, have not, no familiarity with any of that and hear, man, that's dope, you might be thinking somebody is emphatically referring to and identifying something as a substance an illegal substance which is also called dope and in that case is actually also being used in a, uh, a, a in a slang or metaphoric sense that is dope or drugs so very simply depending on your culture depending on your time frame in which you came to understand certain things that are not speak being spoken from its denotation but its connotation you could easily uh, uh, have a different view of how a term or a phrase is being employed. As a matter of fact, I have a 10-year-old, and, and we my, my home is relatively small, fairly small, not relatively small, fairly small, 
two bedroom, one bath, and and so he's on his game and he can talk to the people he's playing along with, and the words that he's using I most assuredly would not use in that way, but I know that he got those definitions uh, uh, from YouTube. Again, here's another one of those uh, modern day things. YouTube, where the people who are playing the games that he is playing, the game that he is playing, they identify certain things, excuse me, so he identifies them in that way. So that is the community. That, as a matter of fact, so I have to try to decipher what in the world he's talking about. I don't know if you've been there, but that's, that's, that's my lot when he is with me. So, so you have to go through a time of trying to identify, trying to understand the different uh, uh, meanings uh, uh, that people are applying to words. Well, truth is a word that has been victimized, yeah, I said it, been victimized by fads, by, by a faddish culture, which over the past probably several decades, uh, uh, knowing the last 10 years easy, has, has essentially taken the the denotation or the actual meaning of the word and that has equivocated it, has made it ambiguous so that it could be modified and, and used in a way that it was not originally intended. As a matter of fact, I'm sure you've heard a phrase like this one. Live your own truth. Uh-huh. Live your own truth. Well, how, about, how about this? Uh, uh, you have your truth and I have mine. Phrases I've certainly heard in the last 10, 15 years. Live your own truth. Man, everybody's got to live their own truth. Pop culture, movies, uh, on and on and on, television shows, they, these phrases are employed. Everybody's got to live their own truth. Now, I won't go into this, and I, and I did put it in my notes because I intended on avoiding it, but we call, we call that truth relative. Well, I'm, I'm going to make this a little easy for you, right? It, 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 you have your truth, I have mine. In both cases, the word truth, in fact, if we're just honest, if we're just willing to, to, to be uh, 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 univocal and specific and clear and not ambiguous, then what we're really doing is replacing the word opinion uh -huh, uh, with the word truth. But understand, there simply cannot be a multiplicity of conflicting truths about any particular given thing, but there can certainly be an in infinite number of opinions. So live your own truth is really live your own opinion of what is. Uh, uh, you have your opinion and I have mine. Now when I was a child and and in my teen years, there was nothing wrong with the word opinion because it was clearly understood that that opinions, if the opinions had not been corroborated, there was no evidence given to set that opinion in a position of facts, or on the basis of facts to call it truth, then we understood that we were not to equivocate or, or, or try to replace or try to diminish or try to, to beguile in any way. No, we simply said that that's opinion. As a matter of fact, I got corrected more than once in my upbringing when I said, yeah, this is the truth. And then I was told by parents and others, typically in authority, no, that's just your opinion. But in a time of relative truth, where well, all truth is truth, anything, all opinion is truth, then what we have done is replace the word opinion with the word truth. And, and indeed, and in fact, by doing so, these multiple conflicting truths about any particular thing, there cannot be an endless, there can, excuse me, be an endless number of opinions with varying degrees from whatever is the actual truth. But by doing this, by equivocating or making it ambiguous, the word truth ambiguous, now we can walk around, yeah, I got the truth, yeah, I got the truth. Yeah, my truth, your truth. Now, I could get into why we might do that, but understand, I think, it, I, I would hope it's probably pretty clear. The word truth really does have a actual meaning, and so to equivocate it 
and, and they regurgitate it back out as to, uh, to say its opinion is to really say that my opinion should be taken as truth which is why we have to say because that doesn't work let me go on and get this in because that doesn't actually work guess what we had to do we had to come up with the next phrase which is live your own truth basically live your own opinion which people do anyway last I checked people live their own opinion anyway let me move on it's not camp them. But before we go any further, we must all understand that no matter how clever we try to be uh, uh, in, in the cover of, of our, own, our opinions, as my father once taught me, not everyone can be right. Not everyone can be right. This is especially true where truth is involved. Uh, uh, this is especially true where the truth is involved. Let me be clear. Let me give you a, a, a biblical study, a teacher uh, notation for you. See, to edify you. See what, why we do it? And that is to understand, I've said this on broadcast right here on this channel, there is one interpretation of Scripture. One proper, uh, clear, in, con clear, concise interpretation of Scripture. Many... Uh, 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 applications. Uh, uh, we don't say opinions, but many applications, many no, uh, many nuances in the text that we could give, as we talked about earlier, uh, that we could give. So understand, one interpretation had a meeting uh, uh, last week, no, week before last, uh, with a gentleman, and he was telling me about a, a meeting he had, or really just a gathering he had uh, recently at his home, and uh, how he shared his views with a dear brother and sister, whom I know, I won't call anybody's names, who we know uh, attend the place of fellowship where we attend. And he went on to state, and, and, and I admit that I, I, it was unfortunate, I'll say it that way, went on to suggest that a view of Scripture that he held was in opposition to their view, but he relegated those different views to basically really in a sense opinion even though he stated that his view of scripture is accurate he didn't use the word but that's what he was conveying on the basis of I see this all through scripture and, I, and I'm sitting there going okay and I've heard those uh, individuals up teaching and, and talking and even preaching and know their view to be wrong it is not a true view of scripture and yet I could tell how desperately he wanted to equivocate. He, he, he want, well, they have their view and I have mine. And I'm not saying mine is better or, or this, that, and the other. And it was unfortunate to hear uh, 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 him do that. Uh, we, look, when it comes to the truth, this is important to what we're teaching tonight, uh, preaching to you today. When it comes to the truth. I don't care how clever our phrase is, you live your truth and I live my truth and, and all of this. I don't care what we try to do to make truth, uh, opinion truth. There is only one truth. There's only one. There may be all kind of versions of it. We have four gospel uh, uh, writings, but only one gospel. There's only one good news message and there's four, four views of that life and time of Jesus. Let's rush on. So John writes in his recounting of that life in ministry, there it is, of Jesus Christ, Jesus' use of the word truth, uh -huh, which here deals with the collection, watch this, this, here it is, it deals with the collection of all that is essentially taught in Scripture. All that is essentially taught in Scripture, but especially as it pertains to God's execution of His will, concerning Christ and the subsequent duties of mankind such as to to have belief in that gospel of Jesus Christ the repentance of sin in light of that gospel of Jesus Christ and faithful obedience to his word etc 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 in other words you shall know God's will concerning me, Jesus is saying in verse 32, and by knowing God's will concerning me, concerning me, for your sakes, and belief in that truth about me, it will make you free. We'll come back to it. 
So we know, uh, if you watched our broadcast in Encouraging Word, we did uh, a survey of John's Gospel. We know that Jesus' audience, we know who his audience was, and we already talked about it earlier as we read through the text. His audience were Jews. He came to the Jews. There may have been, now, now, now be careful here, there may have been some Gentiles who were servants of the Jews or whatever the case may be in and around the time that Jesus is teaching and speaking. It's not to suggest that there literally was no Gentiles in and around the area at all. Remember, you had Roman citizens, you had Romans who were uh, living in the Jewish uh, area, living in Jerusalem, in fact, because the the Roman Empire was the one in charge. So it is not to say, point blank, there was no Gentiles present, but predominantly his, his audience, excuse me, were Jews. Very important. So, so we know who Jesus' audience is, believing and unbelieving Jews. And in fact, the unbelieving Jews were predominantly religious leaders. Were predominantly religious leaders. But who was John writing to? Uh, 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 who was he writing to and why? Before we answer this, we must note that none of the other gospel accounts present this particular uh, uh, event or incident in the life and ministry of Christ. None of the other gospel narr narrators offer this perspective, their perspective, excuse me, on how these particular events or this particular situation went down. This powerful conversation between this crowd and the unbelieving Jews in particular and of course with Jesus Christ during that day. It is generally believed that John was writing to a mixed audience of Jews and Gentiles of course this coming after the death, burial and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. So, so now well into the first century John has sat to pen his gospel and it is generally believed because he used, watch this, we've already talked about it, phrasing, that, uh, words and phrases that had meaning to now, if you will, the global, as they understood it, audience, a uh, 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 body of believers, those coming to faith in Jesus. So now it wasn't just exclusively Jews coming to faith in Jesus. Now you have Jews and Gentiles, and the Gentile word is a generic word for really any non-Jew. So you had people who were from multiple cultures, multiple backgrounds, multiple communities, uh, multiple social economic, social political standings, and John is using phrases, uh, uh, generally speaking it is understood, from not only the Jewish heritage, uh, but also from the Greek heritage, uh, uh, with, with Greek being the predominant uh, language, uh, uh, Koine Greek as a matter of fact, of the first century. Uh -huh. That being said, what was his goal then? What was his goal? Most scholars cite the author's own words in trying to answer this question. The Gospel according to John chapter 20 verses 30 and 31. You don't have to turn there. We, we don't have much time left. 30 and 31 clearly states why he wrote this version of the events of Christ's life. Why he wrote his version of the Gospel and therefore included chapter 8 and those things that happened there. Here is what it says. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, John admits. But these are written that you may believe, uh-huh, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So as we've already stated, and I've got to rush on, that here, what he's talking about in what we call chapter 8, is he's, he's laying out some things, and I, I didn't have time to exp exposit all of it, but he's working up to this point. As a matter of fact, let's look at a couple of those points so we can get a fuller understanding. In our selected passage of Scripture, uh, 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 Jesus has already stated, in, as already stated, is being antagonized by unbelieving Jewish leadership. Uh -huh. Earlier that day, here it is. Let's look at some things. He basically embarrassed them. Uh, this is the opening of the chapter. He basically embarrassed them when they tried to trap him 
by dragging before him a woman caught in the act of adultery. Check it out a little later on. Uh, uh, following that, he revealed to those same leaders that he was the light of the world and they accused him of self-testimony, which was strictly forbidden by the Mosaic law. I believe you'll see that in Exodus. Note, here Jesus makes a clear and emphatic statement of his divine nature and relationship with God the Father. His connection meant that he wasn't speaking or acting alone, but in perfect harmony with God the Father who sent him. I wish I had time to work on it. Finally, he reveals that all he and the Father were doing would culminate, reach a apex in his going away. Uh huh. Most interpret, most of us were, and I did for years, interpret this to mean his ascension back to heaven. But context tells us that's not actually it. Watch this. In verse 28 and 29, watch what he says. So Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own, but just as the Father taught me, I say these things. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, because I always do what pleases him. So that means when he says, excuse me, when I am lifted up, he's not talking about when I ascend back to the right hand of the Father, he's talking about his crucifixion. So, as we approach the words of our selected passage, of our selected text, Jesus reveals to his then audience that he uh -huh, is the light which here means he is the very embodiment of saving truth. Oh, this is wonderful. He is the very embodiment of the saving truth sent from God to dispel the darkness in which it had and, and still does engulf the life of every sinner. I wish I had time. He also wanted to make it clear that he has come directly from God the Father and says, <clears throat> excuse me, and says and does only what his father tells him, which means that everyone acting in opposition to him is by default acting in opposition to his father. I wish I had time, but you can glance over in a few minutes when I'm done to chapter 14. And he said, he said to them, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. And Thomas said, well, show us the father. He said, how long must I be with you that you don't recognize, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, 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 that I come from the father. And as he just said in this incident, I am from the father. The father is with me and has never left me. Which means, brothers and sisters, the, everyone who was standing in opposition to him, everyone who would call out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, was essentially saying, this is how we see the Father, because the Father is in him. And finally, that he is going to be offered up uh, as willed by his Father, and that when he is lifted up, or offered up, not ascending back to the Father, but when he is lifted up upon the cross, all that the Father has willed, remember we talked about that, that, that which is to be executed from God's will. That's what we said truth is in the text. So upon, uh, upon the cross that the Father has willed to be completed in him will be done. Finally, my brothers, we are over time, but give me, if you would grant me so graciously a couple of more moments. Uh, in conclusion, that that is why I read verse 30. Do you remember? I read verse 30 because what he was telling them was and is good news, ladies and gentlemen, that they may believe. So then verse 1, uh, uh, 31, excuse me, said this. Uh, here's the promise to those who were coming to belief in him. Those Jews who were in the audience who had began to believe. Here's what he promised. Verse 31, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. I wish I had time. So notice the next verse. 
And this is really our focus, verse, verse 32. And you will know the truth. Who? Those who continue in my word. Who are those continuing in my word? I'm working backwards now. Those who are coming to believe. Those who are coming to believe. Those are really my disciples. How do you know that you're really my disciples? Because you continue in my word. And if you continue in my word, the, 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 the deliverance hasn't yet come. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Access is at hand. Remember the, the message that he was preaching. I wish I had time. So understand, you shall know that truth. If you continue in my word, you will come to know that truth. And I tell you this truth. Remember, and he is the very embodiment. He is, he is the very embodiment of that truth that the Father wanted conveyed. What is that truth? The very truth is the good news. The very truth is the gospel. The very truth is that which, here, here's what it says, that proceeds from God and that, uh, uh, that its effect is undeniable. Is the last part of that verse. Why is the effect undeniable? Because you shall know that truth, that you're, the word that you're walking in. You shall come to know that truth. You shall come to understand the very word that proceeds from the Father, the very will of God that one, he wants to execute it, which is salvation. I don't have time to go into it. As a matter of fact, let me close my Bible. Let me close all of this out so I won't keep going. Understand, brothers and sisters, and I appreciate your, you giving me a few more moments. Understand what he says in the verses that proceed from 33 on to 38. He said, the sinner, excuse me, uh, uh, the, the, the slave does not abide in the house forever, but the son abides in the house forever. What do you mean, Jesus? Whom the son set free is free indeed. And so what I've come to do, since I'm abiding in the house of God forever, I have come to set those who are enslaved to sin. I have come to get those who are trapped in sin. Well, what did they say? Because they didn't understand. They didn't get it. That We have never been enslaved, which is strange to say, considering they were under Roman rule. But anyway, we have never been enslaved. They didn't understand you are enslaved. One man said, Bishop Jones said, you are enslaved to what is a deception. You are actually enslaved. You just don't realize you're enslaved to sin. But I'm here to encourage you, my brothers and sisters, before we get out of here, that Jesus is that truth, and you shall know the truth. I want to tell you, I know the truth, and it has made me free. It has set me free. And if you are on this channel, and you are a believer in that same Jesus Christ, who is the embodiment, Colossians, I told you I don't have time, but Colossians chapter 1, he is the very exegete, of the Godhead, that's what it means there. He is, the, he is the embodiment of the Godhead. He is the very truth in chapter 14 of John that if you, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And if you believe in the Father, believe also in me, for in my Father's house there are many rooms. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go away to prepare a place for you, and where I go, I come again to receive you unto myself, because where I go, you shall be with me. Understand, I know the truth. And I pray, brothers and sisters, you know the truth. No, not an opinion being packaged as truth. There it is. No, the truth. One singular truth. There is no other way to the Father but through the Son. And you can't come to the Son unless you're drawn or dragged by the Holy Spirit. There it is. I better end right there because I, I can feel that thing bubbling up on the inside of me. I beg you, I plead you, just in case there so happens to be a sinner who's watching this, I beg you come to know the truth. Why? Because whether you want to accept it or not, Paul picks this up in chapter 6, I told you, chapter 6 of Romans, that we are slaves to sin, and Christ came to set us free, and whom the Son set free is free indeed. I'm going to shut it down, be blessed, have a wonderful July 5th, have a wonderful day. I, for those living around where I live, it's a little rainy, but they, 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 ain't no rain going to stop that truth. Ain't no rain going to change that truth. We are free. We might be a little wet, 
but we are free. Might be a little hot here in the South, but we are free. We might be dealing with COVID and dealing with all kind of crises. We are free. You might have lost your job or be laid off and, and worried about the, 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 the climate, the economic climate, the political climate. But if you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you know the truth and you continue in that truth and you walk in that truth, you are his disciples and you are free. Be blessed.